thank you guys for being here on the second day of the Diversity in Cancer webinar. My name is Gregory Vidal. I'm the Director of Clinical Research at West Cancer Center Research Institute in Memphis, Tennessee. I also lead the Breast Cancer Medical Oncology Pro Program and I'm, a, and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Tennessee Health Center. But enough about me. I want to thank the faculty and participants for joining us today for the second day of Diversity in Cancer Care, where we seek to elevate and highlight the power of diversity in many aspects of the cancer continuum with the goal of equity and equality in cancer. Uh, this is the second of the three-day uh, planned uh, webinar event. Uh, I just want to remind you that tomorrow we'll be having a fireside chat with advocates, healthcare leaders, and practitioners, so please join us. Yesterday, we covered diversity in clinical trial, which was very interesting. So today on our panel, we have uh, Dr. Tillman, Tillman from UAMS, uh, Dr. Mitchell from Jefferson Health, Dr. Porter from the West Cancer Center, and Dr. Rodriguez from Sylvester Cancer Center. I'm going to allow each one of them to introduce themselves, uh, the expertise in the field, um, and just talk to us about what they hope to um, have you uh, take from this um, webinar today. So, Dr. Tillman, I'm going to put you, or Henry Tillman, I'm going to put you on the spot and introduce yourself and let us know about you and your expertise. Hi, my name is um, Dr. Rhonda Henry Tillman. I'm at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, Winthrop P. Rockefeller Cancer Institute. I am an expert in health initiative and disparities um, research. I'm also the division chief and expert in breast surgical oncology. I serve as a leader, a teacher, and an educator, and the vice chair of the Department of Surgery at the university. For many years, I have been an expert in looking at disparities in how to address early detection and access to cancer um, care, developing programs all across the South that ex expanded all of the counties um, in Arkansas. I've been in Tennessee and Mississippi, um, many areas trying to make a difference. I do believe early detection changes lives, access to care, access to the importance of all types of treatments um, across um, the state. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for that. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, uh, would you introduce yourself? Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Vidal for inviting me to be a part of this. And of course, I'm always happy to do anything associated with um, Memphis and Tennessee. Um, I'm Dr. Edith Mitchell. I'm a medical oncologist uh, at the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center at Jefferson uh, in Philadelphia, where I'm one of the associate directors of the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center I am the founding member and head of uh, the Center to Eliminate Cancer Disparities. In working in this field over many years, uh, I have taken care of and conducted research in a number of cancers, and that included um, GI malignancies, which is my primary research area, but also in breast uh, prostate cancer and myeloma. So after deciding I was in so many different uh, fields, I decided to uh, call it the Center to Eliminate Cancer Disparities. Uh, I work in disparities, um, conduct research there, as well as the other areas that I've mentioned. Uh, I've been fortunate to uh, be a part of the National Cancer program, which as you know, uh, we just finished 50 years of, uh, but I've been on the uh, clinical trials um, advisory committee, CTAC, uh, on the translational research area, 
Uh, I am currently on the NIH uh, Council of Councils and the um, SGM, which is uh, Sexual and Gender Minority Committee uh, for um, NIH. And I'm currently on the president's cancer panel. I also have another area uh, that I've worked in, and that is um, I'm certified in aerospace medicine as well, and was in the Air Force. Uh, I had a medical school scholarship and owed the Air Force two years of service. And two years turned out to be 36 years, seven months and 23 days. And I am the first woman physician um, ever promoted to the rank of Brigadier General in the history of the Air Force. So I've done a lot in disparate uh, areas and I'm happy to be here tonight. Thank you so very much for this introduction. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Dr. Vidal, for this uh, invitation and really honored to be with this amazing panel and inspired by all of you. Um, so I work as Associate Director of Community Outreach at the University of Miami Sylvester Cancer Center. So we serve uh, mostly a Hispanic community and I'm a thoracic oncologist. So what I do uh, during the day is see patients with, that have lung malignancies and really try to break barriers to enroll more patients in clinical trials. So I, I'm here because this is personal. Um, I am an immigrant to this country and I do see the barriers um, that our patients face uh, when they face our medical system. And I think we can do a lot to disrupt the system and make it more equitable, um, especially on clinical trials and screening. So delighted to be here and be part of the conversation. Thank you, thank you very much. And Dr. Porter, who we saw yesterday, who has kindly come on again today um, in uh, the stead of Dr. Bupati, who couldn't make it. So Dr. Porter, tell us about yourself again. All right, so thank you so much for not making me introduce myself after Dr. Mitchell, <laughs> <laughs> who is obviously amazing. Um, but you too, Dr. Rodriguez, you know, I follow you and I um, pay close attention to what you're doing and what you're presenting on the national and international scene for lung cancer. Happy to be here with you all tonight. Um, thank you again for letting me come on. Um, I am a native Memphian. So here in Memphis at the West Cancer Center, I was born and raised in Memphis. I did my undergrad medical school, um, internal medicine residency fellowship training all here in Memphis. So Memphis through and through. I spent a little time at Vanderbilt and got some specialty training in thoracic oncology, but found myself right back here in Memphis. I think it's the Mississippi River that just drew me back because it's so clean and beautiful, right? No. <laughs> So, but um, I, I came back to Memphis really to serve the community that I grew up in. Um, my dad was an oncology patient in the community here and a patient at the West Cancer Center. Um, my mom was a patient in the community, uh, in the oncology community here um, with the UT Cancer Institute um, previously um, here in Memphis and um, my granddad. So I have a lot of family history in oncology care in Memphis. And I had a lot of different experiences. My dad was insured he was a primary caregiver or um, breadwinner for our family. And after he died, it left my mom with already pre-existing conditions. And so she was unsure, uninsured through her cancer journey. And it was a very different experience for the two. Um, and so I got to see both sides of that coin and um, just vowed that I would stay here in the community to serve the community that had been so good to me. And so I'm happy to be here tonight to not, um, we talked about clinical trials last night, but to talk about um, just clinical care tonight and um, look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. So Dr. Mitchell, I'm going to come back to you. Um, could you explain to our audience um, why you're in a car? I'm sorry? Could you explain to our audience why you're in a vehicle? <laughs> yes, um, Dr. Vidal, I am in a vehicle. I'm not the driver. <laughs> um, but uh, I live in Philadelphia. And um, I received an invitation from the President of the United States uh, just a few days ago uh, to join him and others on his presentation to the country on what he planned to do about cancer in America. And it was just an exciting uh, event. There were lots of people from very different uh, disciplines 
there were members of Congress, and he explained that one, he intended to uh, increase funding for um, cancer, and he hoped that Congress would uh, support that. Uh, and he had a number of people from the Congress there. Um, he indicated that he would like to decrease cancer death rates uh, in the country by 50% over the next um, 20 or so years. Um, and he wanted research in various areas, but he also wanted to increase screening uh, because the earlier a cancer is found, the better the treatment outcomes are likely to be. And with uh, some screening procedures, there is actually prevention. And he mentioned colorectal cancer uh, as being prevented uh, by uh, polyp removal and so forth. And overall, uh, it was a fantastic program where he talked about uh, his uh, experience with cancer care for his son. Uh, the first lady talked about uh, friends with cancer and how we all needed to work together. And then the vice president, um, Harris, talked about uh, her mother, who was a cancer researcher, uh, but who died of colon cancer. And she talked about uh, the um, mental challenge as well as physical of taking care of uh, end stage um, cancer patients and how we needed to uh, do a lot of work to increase research so that more people are living longer periods of time uh, with cancer. And then he really focused on early diagnosis of cancer so that physicians' treatment outcomes uh, could be uh, improved and therefore this was important for patients. Uh, so overall, um, at least in the room, um, the message was well received. Uh, and I'm actually interested in seeing the late night news tonight to see what um, the news reporters are uh, talking about it. I have had the opportunity to talk to a couple of media outlets uh, since the program. So Dr. Vidal, I have been on Zoom or Zoom-like uh, entities for a long time this afternoon. Well, we certainly appreciate you being on this Zoom or Zoom-like um, because we appreciate your experience and insight. So I want to read this quote. Um, uh, the uh, Sanford James, the co-chair of ASCO Health Equity and Outcome Committee, said, before we really tackle inequities in cancer, we need to face and acknowledge the impact historical and structural discrimination has had on the healthcare system in the United States. Dr. Tillman, Henry Tillman, mm -hmm. I keep forgetting the Henry, tell me what that statement means to you. Um, <clears throat> I would just give me, give me your, your opinion on what you think he's trying to say and what that statement means. When he talks about tackling what has happened or what has happened in the past, I can only give you or address that through my experience. I grew up in a small rural town called Blyville, Arkansas. You're probably familiar with it being from um, Memphis, Tennessee. I went away to school in California where I graduated from medical school at UCSD School of Medicine. And I came back to Arkansas and we were talking about addressing cancer health. And I was told, well, black people won't come to the doctor or we won't come to see a doctor. We don't trust the doctor. Mm -hmm. 
And I always remembered when I was a little girl trying to go to the doctor, we dressed up. It was an important thing to go in to be able to get health care. It's just that we didn't have the opportunities to go into health care. Now, if you were in a military, Dr. Mitchell talked about her career in the, the military. A lot of individuals had access to care, health care in the military. And my father was in the military and we had an Air Force base where we were able to go to that Air Force base to get health care. But not many people in my community could go to a, a physician because they would not see them. And so if there's no access or no care or no one's wanting to see you, you have to look at that as an inequity. And so if you look at also from a historical perspective, we had to build our own school and train our own physicians to even care for it for um, people of different races and different um, backgrounds. Why do, we, why do we depend on our HBCUs? The number of physicians, if you look historically of where our physicians and, and our care came from, it was because of the historical black institutions that trained us to care for ourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez, from, from uh, the Latinx that's Hispanic perspective, what, what does that mean, that statement mean to you and the community? Um, so it means that, you know, there's been, so medicine is built on a lot of privilege, um, a lot of information and knowledge that has been kept away from patients. And, you know, for the Latino community, language barriers is a big one. And under insurance or lack of insurance is another big one. But I think um, there is also a historical experience from, especially, you know, I trained in New York and they were in, in Puerto Rico, there were experiments done on, 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 on Latina women in terms of like um, different parts of their healthcare and their women's health. So we have not been there. This kind of follows this history of distrust and, um, and not being having the knowledge to be able to be at par with the provider is something that has really impacted the care of my family. And I think that is something that as we have more providers who understand this and we can address it, we we get it. Like when I when I see patients and they come to me with fears and they're distrustful, I know where they're coming from. I understand what where that where that's coming from. Why do you have that distrust of what I'm telling you? Um, and I think we can start the conversation there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Because I do think in order to um, solve this problem, we really do have to understand at its core where the problem is coming from um, and the history behind it. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, and uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but give me your perspective of, of where do you think the root of the issue, the disparities that we're seeing in care, um, where your perspective of where that comes from? You're, you're, in, you're on mute? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, I certainly appreciate uh, the comments made uh, by our colleagues, Dr. Henry Tillman uh, and Dr. Rodriguez. So I'd like to add a different perspective. Uh, in August of 2021, last year, there was an article about uh, the slaves first arise, uh, arriving in colonial America and the historical document indicated that they had arrived 402 years ago from August of last year, and that um, the slaves or the black, they weren't called slaves then, they were black people. When they arrived in America, uh, there were many dead on the ships and others severely ill. And here we are 402 years later talking about disparities in healthcare uh, that have been continued through the ages. And I always tell my students, look at the historical perspective. Um, James Baldwin said, if you know from whence you came, you, there's no limit to what you can do. 
And I think we need to do that. There are some instances that have set the culture for disparities in healthcare in America. I'll tell you about two of them. One, uh, National Medical Association was formed in 1895 because black doctors had applied for membership in a number of organizations and were denied membership because they were black. So the NMA was formed in 1895. It is to this day a organization, an organization that fosters uh, health care for blacks initially, but for all individuals in this country, uh, such that we should have equal access to care. Uh, Dr. Til Dr. Henry Tillman and I lecture on this every year and have been doing that a long time. The other is the impact of the uh, Flushnell Report in 1910. So doctor, uh, he wasn't a doctor even. The Flexner Report closed seven black medical schools in this country, leaving only uh, Meharry and Howard. And other uh, uh, medical schools did not allow many blacks to enter those schools. So for many decades, uh, blacks who were interested in medicine had no recourse to study uh, and gain a path. And what that allowed for, for almost no to take care of black folks country, not only that, the Flexner Report has a section that says black doctors should not be trained in surgery, guilty care. Their mission should be uh, to serve as hygienists and sanitarians, sanitarians, uh, to teach black folks how to prevent infectious diseases such as tuberculosis and prevent them from spreading those diseases to whites. Now that set the culture of medical care in this country up until the administration of President Johnson in the late 60s. So that has set the culture and that the Flexner Report is still a major focus in many medical schools in this country. And the Flexner Report has done more to kill black folks than anything else uh, that you can uh, discuss from using scientific methods. So I thank you. Thank you very much for that insight, that historical insight. So Dr. Porter, we understand um, that this history goes back. Um, and as a result of that, we see disparities in health. COVID has opened this really, really wide open, um, where we see folks of color uh, being have worse outcomes. So how do we move on from here to start addressing those issues? For example, how do we then um, close that gap. Memphis has been one of the, I think maybe 2013, had, his, had the greatest disparity in large cities in mortality between whites and blacks from breast cancer. Um, this is a very complicated problem. How do you go about trying to address this? You know, I think that um, all of the comments that we just heard really kind of point to a couple of things. Number one, we heard the, the his story all the way back, you know, 400 plus years, um, back to the 60s with the report and and all of the changes that, all of the things that have happened really take us to a place where we have to say, okay, there's gonna be some losses in the coming years because of the lack of screening, because of the lack of access. But what we can do is start with our children now and educate our children now and one of the most exciting things that I've seen um, is over the last, I think it was just yesterday even, was the urology match, the national urology match. And all of the different people that I've seen who matched into urology and to surgery, you know, this surgical specialty this year, I saw a lot of different skin tones and, uh, you know, I saw women and men. So it's no longer just a, a monotone 
you know, monosex demographic that's going into this surgical specialty. So what I'm seeing now is that, you know, and what I'm doing um, personally here in Memphis is I have high school students that come in shadow. Um, one student started with me as a sophomore in high school and she's worked all the way up. She's graduating from college and has a, applied to medical school this year. And, and so I, we have to start with the young people and get them trained so that we can get them into medical schools and help them overcome those barriers. Access now, you know, for the young people, not only to, to healthcare, but to education and to the things that Dr. Mitchell was just, re, re, um, just, just talking about. As we educate the younger generations, you know, I'm gonna see patients in the, in the coming couple of decades that maybe are not gonna benefit, but over time we change the, the story. Um, it doesn't, it's not gonna happen overnight. It didn't, it didn't happen overnight. We didn't get here overnight, um, and so it's going to take a little bit of time. But I think educating the young people now is really what's going to make a, a huge difference in the future, and not just the minorities, but educating everybody. You know, to to see minorities as as equal. You know, and and you know, educating young young white children. You know, hey, my daughter's no different from you. Um, and as we do that, then we'll be able to um, to really change the story going forward and make sure that that we provide access to not only the care but the education so that there will be representation for all different demographics in healthcare. Dr. Tillman, we have two minutes before the break, but Dr. Porter talks about training people representation. Uh, there are a number of doctors around here. Why is it important that you have representation? Your physician looks like you have had your experience. You know, I, I used to all that it is important. And I used to always think that if a person could have someone that understood their culture, that they would do better. But every I have this one question that I often ask patients. First, I ask, what took you so long to come in to see me? And that's to my patients that have advanced disease. And we talk about breast cancer and as, as an expert in breast cancer, still women present with stage three and four stage breast cancer in a local disease that you can see. And um, it's fear, fear for them. And, um, and, I, and for the first time, I, and, and I share this story because we always think it is about having someone just like you in front of you, but it's also about that in, individual. And I've been learning that more and more. I've been practicing now for 20 years. And um, it is about how that individual trusts the health care system. We're going to go to, to um, break and we'll get back to that when we're on the other end of break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys, and we're back. Um, so before the break, um, Dr. Henry Tillman was talking about representation and we understand the importance of representation, but I think she was also saying it's not everything. Um, having shared experience and even competence um, mm -hmm. is really important uh, with this journey. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Rodriguez, we cannot always get a black doctor in front of a black patient, a Hispanic doctor in front of a, uh, Hispanic patients. Um, we have much more um, Caucasian healthcare professionals. How do we then um, assess uh, our colleagues in um, helping provide the best care for minority patients? How do we make this more of a shared decision between the patient and the physician? I think that, um, you know, I agree with you. We can't really all be on sync in terms of provider and patient, but we can do a better job of communicating what are the needs of the patient. So for example, for the Hispanic community, you know, I, I feel when I enroll patients in clinical trials, sometimes people check the box and say there's a Spanish consent, but that's really only part of the communication that needs to happen for a patient to understand the trial. Like culturally, that patient may need you to call the mother and call the sister and follow up and make that patient feel like they will feel in their family. So there's this, there's this need um, that may be a cultural need of how you process information and who are the who helps you make decisions. And I think that that's very different culture to culture. And I think respecting that 
and also bringing other people in the room. I mean, now with COVID, all our hospitals are closed, but by telemedicine, we are bringing family members that help with those decisions. We also have a lot of other healthcare workers who can help in that process. So if you don't speak Spanish in Miami, there'll be people in your staff who do that can come in the room and help you kind of fill in that gap. And I think it's also about um, some humility, like asking questions and listening, uh, because I think we're so used, especially when we don't have enough time as physicians to kind of get to the point and move 15 minutes later, move to the next patient. It's really a disservice to that patient. Like you really need to circle back to the patient, follow up. And it's, I think you also have to have some humility. Like you would, how would you feel uh, personally, uh, how you feel about a family member getting information and what kind of things they will need. So I think some of it is, is, is universal, uh, but there are some cultural um, needs that should be addressed. And I think you can bring other people to the room, either family members, caretakers, people in the community, navigators. There's a lot of people that can help in that process. Thank you. I really do uh, feel that. Dr. Porter, I wanted to come back to um, something you mentioned in your introduction. Um, your personal experience of having a parent with insurance and a parent with it, without insurance going through the same system. Um, tell us some of uh, the differences that you noticed um, and your perspective on how those could be addressed. Well, one of the things that, that we saw um, with, with my mom who wasn't insured so this is a story just briefly. She had abdominal pain a couple of consecutive Decembers. The first time she went in, they diagnosed her with gallstones. It happened again, diagnosed her with gallstones. So she was having a procedure, but the tissue wasn't being sent to pathology. Gallstones, the end, discharged from the hospital. The third time, the, the gastroenterologist that did the procedure came back and said, you know, Ms. Porter, I don't think that these are gallstones. No, they're, in, they're intrahepatic tumors. I mean, they're inter... Intra, um, um, I'm trying to get the words out. It's not coming to me. Anyway, they're in the bile ducts and they're tumors. You know what cal yeah. calendula carcinoma is. So she's got these tumors growing in, but there's no pathology. There's no assessment. You know, you don't have insurance. We got your um, symptoms improved. We're just going to go ahead and discharge you now. You know, technically with or without insurance, that's malpractice. Um, there's not much to, else to say about that. It just wasn't done right. Um, but with my dad's, um, he had insurance. He got a chance to go to the West Cancer Center um, back then, you know, premier in Memphis, um, still is, obviously. Uh, but, you know, he got a great oncologist and, and did a great workup and was able to, but unfortunately with small cell lung cancer. So that didn't change his outcome necessarily. But two years prior with my mom, if she had, you know, the, the right workup and the right uh, pathology and the you know, the right access to surgery, because if she had uh, uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma that had been diagnosed much earlier, maybe surgery would have been an option for her. But by the time she was diagnosed, um, it was, you know, widely, you know, locally advanced. And so she wasn't a, a surgical candidate at that point, but we wasted two years, you know. So, you know, does it, did it make a difference? Was it the insurance or was it that particular doctor? And even after she got her diagnosis, we had times where we needed a surgical evaluation. She wasn't a surgical candidate, but I tell you what, we owe it to patients to just go and talk to them, whether or not we can help them. And so the surgeon never came to see her. We were hospitalized for about seven days and we waited and waited and the residents came and they were great. But my mom knew the difference between the resident and, and the, the, you know, the staff physician. And so even though the residents and the residents with, without a lot of confidence would say, we don't think that you can have surgery, but he's going to see you tomorrow. We don't think you can have surgery, but he's going to see you tomorrow. And then we were discharged. And I will never forget the day that I was putting my mom back in the car and we were about to leave the hospital. She stopped. She dropped her head and she looked really disappointed, like a kid who didn't get a toy that they wanted for Christmas. And I was like, mom, what's wrong? He never came to see me. There was nothing I could say. I just put her in the car and we drove home, you know, and it was a sad experience. Um, and, and I can't help but wonder, well, if she had insurance, you know, Cigna or Aetna or something, would he have at least just come to say, you know, I'm sorry, your tumor's locally advanced and we can't resect it, but at least come to say it because in that patient's mind, I'm waiting for some closure. You know, I'm, I need that closure so that I know I did what I could for myself, even if I don't make it, you know. 
So I think that um, that that's just my personal experience. And I don't know that the insurance was actually what made the difference in our case, in our two cases, but you know, you have to wonder. And so with that being my experience as a healthcare provider where I can see the differences, because I'll tell you what happened um, about a year later, I found out that that particular surgeon had a tumor very similar to my mom's and probably already knew that diagnosis and didn't necessarily want to face it and have to talk to a patient who was going through what they felt like they may go through soon. So as a healthcare provider, now knowing what I knew about my mom's case, then I can see the differences and I don't feel so slighted. But um, for for lay people who may or may not know those differences, this is where distrust comes in, you know, when we have experiences like this. And so when we can be very transparent and talk very clearly and openly with our patients, communicate, communication is key. Um, even like um, Dr. Rodriguez was saying, just giving a patient, uh, you know, a consent form that says, oh, you got a Hispanic version, so now you know everything. That's not enough. We have to communicate. We have to talk. We have to make sure that people really do understand. I use analogies all the time to break things down to a level that I know my patient can understand because all of them don't have college degrees and don't understand all of the things we're going to say. So, but you didn't ask me about that. You asked me about insurance, but the point is that I'm not a hundred percent certain that my, my parents' cases were different because of the access and insurance. But, you know, at the time I couldn't help but wonder. Yeah, I have a very similar experience with my mom being an immigrant um, and having leukemia and not being able to get diagnosed um, early enough <clears throat> for one that I think was probably very curable. Um, Dr. Mitchell, uh, in terms of systems, uh, what can a system, healthcare, like take West Clinic, for example, what can we do as an institution uh, to make sure that the least of those within our institutions get equal care, have equal outcomes? So that's a great question. And I can tell you, in Philadelphia, there are lots of people with good insurance. And when I get to see them, they have had lousy medical care. So it's not just insurance. It's the whole healthcare system and the culture that um, Flexner Report set up. And with that, it is hard for um, individuals in some Northeastern cities to have equal uh, recognition of their medical expertise. Uh, it is hard for individuals who have insurance to get the appropriate care. And you know, there is a study that was done in several Northern uh, cities where uh, the time spent with physicians was measured and evaluated according to uh, the background of the patient. And black patients had two minutes less than whites in a 20 minute um, uh, visit. So it's not just um, lack of access lack of insurance. So insurance does not equal to granting access. Uh, there are some black patients who are wealthy and come in with inappropriate management that could be related to uh, the color of their skin or uh, other, other factors. The same thing is true with um, physicians. There are some physicians who don't recognize our expertise, knowledge, and experience. And we've seen that in several uh, instances. And I have seen it in multiple ones. I've got a few years on everybody else 
that's here tonight. And I can tell you, uh, there are some experiences. Um, but I think we all need to continue to speak. When we see something, uh, as Representative Lewis said, say something. And we, we all have to work together to not accept these um, communications and conversations. So uh, let's be John Lewis about it. And you, you have thank to you. say something. Thank you very much for that insight. So let's, let's move into technology a little bit. Um, COVID has opened up, uh, I guess, this uh, book of um, options for moving healthcare forward. How do we use technology, be it remote monitoring, be it virtual visits? Um, and Dr. Henry Tillman, I'm, I'm addressing you. Uh, how do we um, use those avenues to address some of the disparities or, um, well, I would say disparities that we see in healthcare? You know, I've always used um, as much technology as I can to communicate and work with patients. Every patient that sees me has my cell phone number, but not every patient will use it every, you know, it's very interesting. But if I take care of a patient, they have my number because I am the one that's caring for them. Whether we communicate on phone, whether we communicate across telemedicine, but it's so important. Social media has changed things. When a patient sees me, they know everything about me. When they walk into my, my office, they're gonna tell me what I do, what they saw on social media about me and why they came to me most of the time today most of the time. And I think that we have to be conscientious of that. And it is true. They're going to know you better than you could ever, um, ever imagine. They know everything about you when they walk in that door, because we are so good at utilization of social media. And I think that during COVID, um, it taught a lot of providers a lot. I mean, some people aren't even still seeing patients. They're doing it across telemedicine because it could be more effective, more efficient. If you live in rural areas where you have to travel two or three hours, you know, people will call me and I'm a breast doctor and they'll go, can you look at this? And they'll show me a picture of their breast on, you know, I'm like, okay, we, I got it. But it is a way for us to provide care. And it's Thank important. You. Yes, it is. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez, how, how much is virtual visit and virtual technology um, taken up by, by the Hispanic community? Is that utilized? And are you seeing any issues in terms of new disparities forming as a result of this technology? So we have looked at that in our own um, patient population. So we, we over the last six months, over well, the last year, we've been kind of tracking how many patients um, request uh, in-person versus telehealth. So most of our patients, especially the older patients, favor still in-person visits. And a lot of it has to do with technical divide and really the complexity of getting online. And we, you know, we can do a lot to get patients to that point, but really, in 15 minutes to, for me to teach a patient how to use a computer and how to log in, it's a lot, um, it's really more than we really are equipped to do. And I think, and then also by age group, we have seen big differences that after 65, a lot of patients really don't have that, that ease of connection um, online, especially if there's um, Hispanics, like they really would like to come in and, and, and bring the patient. But I agree with Dr. Henry Tillman that really having that technology has allowed us to kind of break some barriers in other ways because it is expensive to drive to a cancer center. It is expensive for family members to take a day off. So I think it has become very convenient for the people and I think it's here to stay. But the technical divide is a real thing. And, um, and to really overcome it, we have to make a better technology. There's a lot of really cool things you can do online with electronic medical records to collect patient information. Patients are getting emails, but 
some of this is really above what patients want to do. And I think we're kind of, some of it, we're kind of imposing technology on patients who really don't, are not ready, or maybe not, might not be interested. But when we look at our population, we still have over 80% of patients favor in-person visits for the first visit. Thank you very much. And, and also, um, the, the possibility of getting other family members in that visit. Uh, instead of you know one on one virtual visit allows us to bring that community into the visit. We have uh, less than five minutes, so I want to ask and and Dr. Mitchell, you were talking about this a little bit. What role can our local and federal government play um, uh, in in trying to help us uh, close these gaps that we've been talking about all night? So first of all, I think we need to make sure that we know our uh, representatives uh, who represent us at many uh, different facets. We also need to know how to communicate with them and make sure they know us and that they take your calls and that these calls don't go just to, you know, a 25 year old or a young uh, office worker. Uh, and then um, discuss with them and get their buy-in uh, to helping us with the needs of our communities. Uh, and we really need to, to do that. Uh, I practice in Philadelphia, but um, Medicaid, which of course is run by the state, um, is different. I've got Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, um, and New York, so four different states, uh, and all of their plans are different. All of their recognition of who their disparate communities are, are different. So we need to have a central communication. And that was in the message that the president had tonight uh, when he had members of Congress there um, in the process because we can't do uh, health policy and set up new guidelines and more importantly, pay for them. So we've got to convince our colleagues to work with us and make sure that we are giving access to everyone. So access to all, I think is very important. And we can talk about it, but we can't uh, set up the structure for insurance, Medicaid, and other payments for patient services. Thank you very much. We could spend thing, all night just, oh, go ahead. One thing I'd like to say about communications, there are many individuals who do not have an iPhone or other technology. So what we've done in our office, the office staff calls the patient uh, a day or so before their uh, appointment. And then they let me know that this patient only has a flip phone and that I need to make a phone call and not use the advanced technology. So we've got to get our office staff working with us so that they can help and they understand disparities and can work with us in eliminating disparities. Thank you very much for that very important insight. So we come to the end of our program. We can talk about this all day, all night, um, but I really want to thank the, pan thank the panel, um, particularly Dr. Porter, who showed up at last minute, but Dr. Henry Tillman, Dr. Mitchell, and Dr. Rodriguez, thank you very much for being a part of this program. And the information was very helpful and very insightful. I want to encourage the um, participant and audience to again um, give us your ear tomorrow as we have a fireside chat with some um, patient advocates, healthcare professionals, and physicians talking about their their personal journey through um, their cancer care. Again, thank you very much and have a good night. Good night. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank and you. we're recruiting for the National Medical Association. I would like to see everyone here attending 
uh, National Medical Association programs. Okay, let us know. Thank we'll you. see you there. Okay. Okay. okay, I'll see you there, Dr. Henry Tillman. Yes. Thank you.